Welcome to the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily williams Birch, and today we are talking to one of my longtime friends, Dr. Troy Robertson. This episode was curated by our friends over at the ACDA Advocacy and Collaboration Committee, and we're going to be talking to Dr. Robertson's wife, who's also Dr. Robertson, later as we discuss what it means to be choir directors, music teachers, and handle mental health. In this part of the conversation with Dr. Troy Robertson, we talk about how we set boundaries and guard our time, and we look at that through the lens of the different stages of our careers, early career, mid-career, late career, and what are some of the things we can do, especially going into the new year, to set us up for success. As always, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Perform International. Y'all, I'm so excited about all the places that they are taking people right now. So if you are thinking about choir tour, if you're thinking about going anywhere, if you just want to talk about ideas, go check out perform-international.com. Let them know Emmy sent you or just contact me and I'll get you in contact with them because they're awesome human beings and y'all best tours ever. Anyway, You can't go on tour if you haven't learned how to guard your time and make space for those type of things. So let's talk to my friend, Dr. Troy Robertson. Today on the Music Ed Matters podcast, we are talking to my longtime friend, an amazing choral educator and all those things, Dr. Troy Robertson. Hello, Dr. Robertson. Hello. It's good to be with you. I'm always so excited to see you. We have known each other for eons. We have been colleagues and friends, y'all. Troy called me a colleague for the first time when I was like, I may be 21. And I'm like, oh, no one's ever called me a colleague before. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Tell the listeners, who is Dr. Troy Robertson? Well, uh, I think first and foremost for this podcast, I'm a choir nerd. I'm just somebody who's always loved music and being part of music. So I was about three for like probably a lot of listeners. Um, and then I I went through a great high school program, Judy Spears in Georgia, and did Allstate and Governor's Honors and all kinds of nerdy choir stuff. And from there, went to Furman with uh, Bing Vic and Bill Thomas. And from there, taught. Oh, no, sorry. Then I went to uh, UNCG with uh, Bill Young and Bill Carroll in Greensboro, North Carolina. From there, taught for several years in North Carolina at East Gaston High School, then down to Florida State University. This is just like me bopping around the different states. Uh, Florida State University uh, with um, a whole bunch of awesome people, including you. I don't want to name everybody. It would take too long. And then I taught in New York for one year. And then now I'm I'm at uh, Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas, the cowboy capital of, of uh, I guess, the world. Um, really? Yeah, That's yeah. your claim to fame. And this is my 12th year. I'm halfway through my 12th year at Tarleton. So. Wow. It has gone by so quickly. It has. Yeah. It seems like quicker every year. Okay. What all do you teach at Tarleton? A lot. So this semester I'm teaching a a cross-disciplinary class of vocal techniques for band students. I'm teaching choral techniques. I'm teaching um, four different ensembles, chamber choir, uh, my men's group, Texan writers, my center bass group, my treble ensemble, Texan harmony, um, and then University Singers, which is a combination of a lot of folks into about a hundred voice choir for our big choral orchestral stuff. So a whole bunch of teaching. That's a, that's a six load. That's six classes. It's it's a little crazy this semester. Um, yeah, but it's great. I love it. Is that considered an overload? That's an overload, but I bet it's a very rewarding overload. Uh, well, and then clinical teacher supervision. Um, no, I mean, it's, I mean, it, yeah, it's really busy, but it's, it's a great, it's a great load. It's a good load to have. All right. So listeners, Troy was selected with his awesome wife, also Dr. Robertson. Tell us a smidge about Steph and she'll be on the podcast later. Yeah. Stephanie is a psychologist. She is here at Tarleton. Uh, She, I always forget the exact name, um, but it's essentially, uh, she has a center that serves children and families here in the area um, with assessment and some counseling, but mostly assessment because there's a real backlog of assessment. We're in a rural area And so it can take six months for kids to get assessment. Um, They do some pro bono, thanks to some grants, as well as uh, state legislature budgeting. Um, And then they also do a lot of service to surrounding schools and contract with those schools. And then she also teaches one class a semester. So talk about, I mean, the whole Robertson family has overload. And isn't your son like 10 now? 
Winston is also an overload. Yeah, he's doing basketball and wee blows and soccer all the same time, handbells. Yeah. So. Oh my gosh. That's so much fun. Okay. So the reason that we brought the Robertsons on, and this is part one of a two part thing. So don't worry, you'll hear from the other Dr. Robertson in the future. But the reason we brought you on is in a conversation, one of our meetings for the ACDA Standing Committee for Collaboration and Advocacy, I said that backwards, we were talking about how there's a big need to address the elephant in the room, which is burnout, burnout for early level teachers, burnout for late level teachers, burnout for all the teachers in the middle. I heard from the rumor mill that you and Stephanie were working on some research in that area. Can you give us some insight? Yeah, well, I, we have been um, on this topic in one way or another since we went back to school in 2008. So um, in my, and it's primarily driven by my experience as a new teacher. Um, and so my main concern is making sure that new teachers guard their time just a little bit because it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking you can do it all. People are excited about you and want you to help out with all the different things. And, uh, and that happened to me. I ended up doing many, many things all at once and wasn't the best teacher I could be probably for that reason. And so um, our work in trying to make sure people think about how to keep everything in balance is, uh, is born out of that personal experience. So you say guard your time, but Dr. Robertson, you are teaching four <laughs> ensembles, multiple classes, and supervising student teachers. How well, are you is, guarding your time? Yeah, this is this is the reason that I, I am the one who, <laughs> who sort of drives the train is because if it were up to me, I probably would have taken also a church job and I would have taken, you know, additional responsibilities beyond what I already have. And so for me, this is cut back. Oh, this uh, is guarded. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because I still, you know, because I still also do, um, you know, I just did a virtual choir last weekend, believe it or not. Um, you know, I still compose. I mean, there's still other things I love to do, um, but it can go beyond the area of just being sort of busy and working a lot of hours into really dragging yourself from one thing to the next and no longer enjoying what you do because you haven't been careful about the things to which you've said yes. So you and Steph started this research back in 08. And what have I heard you did a presentation on it? I want to hear more about that. Yeah, we actually wrote an article for the Coral Journal, um, and I'm not going to remember the year, but I think it was maybe fall of, um, I think it might have come out in fall of 2020 or 2021. Um, and that was after we did a presentation at Southwest ACDA. Um, and that presentation, in addition to just sort of talking about guarding your time. Stephanie is the professional. And so she also offered a lot of resources. Um, our presentation can probably be found online. It's called Remember You. And the idea is that there are things that we do as choral directors that matter more to people than just a job. A lot, a lot of times we talk about our, our vocation as a calling and we're there with people for big events in their lives, you know, weddings and funerals where they're with people for the span of their lives. So for example, um, in my orchestral, choral orchestral group, I have everything from some high school seniors up through folks who are 80, 82 years old. I think our oldest folk, our oldest lady in there is 82 years old. Um, and so you're, you're really dealing with important issues with people through the span of their lives. And that makes our job just a little bit different from some other uh, lines of work where maybe you're not with someone for the whole span of their life and you're not talking about things via song that are deepest you know deepest felt emotions and heartfelt things with them it's, it's not things issues that matter more to them than anything else and that that creates its own kind of stress and so thinking about how to manage that how to keep yourself from getting sort of lost in all of that investment that you're doing so we'll bring stephanie on and get all of those actual from the psychiatrist tips and tools but can you talk us through Let's look at the different eras of our profession. So let's start with what you're helping equip your new teachers with. What are some of the things you're teaching them or helping them prepare so they can guard their time? That's a, that's a really great question because it is different at every point in your life. So they're coming out of school. They want to make a name for themselves. They want to get to that, what they view as maybe an ideal job. Maybe their first job is not their ideal job. So they want to do everything they can to build up a great reputation. Um, so it's really, again, it's really tempting to say yes to everything. So with my undergraduates, I'm mostly talking through the opportunities to say yes, and then being careful about looking at how that might really impact you. We also look at the financial element of that because for a lot of students, they think to themselves, all right, I'm going to have a job for the first time ever. I need to work off my student loans or I need to make sure I can afford whatever it is that I want to do with my life. 
And so the, the money becomes an attractive element as well. And so we talked through a little bit of financial literacy. You know, what does it really mean to have a car? You know, do you have to have a new car? What does it mean if you have um, a partner and you have to have childcare? What, you know, what does that look like in terms of the cost versus benefit of another job? That sort of stuff. Um, and so we, we sort of look at things holistically. Stephanie has a great framework for all of the major areas of wellness and we we go around that little wheel of you know this area whether it's mental well-being material well-being you know friendship social that sort of stuff don't mind the ambulance and fire truck that is currently the joys of living downtown at the moment sorry for that noise right. it makes me think actually when i i remember sitting down with dr bowers the first year that we were both at florida state and so vividly there was this conversation that she would have with us about the stools of life and how your stool had multiple legs and it can survive if not all the legs are fed, but there has to be at least three of those stool legs that are established for you to be successful in your life. And it kind of sounds like this framework. So for these early year teachers or just starting out teachers, what are some of the things that you encourage them to look into beyond the financial um, ability to manage that part, but also just saying yes, what are they looking at? What are you having them balance? What are some examples? I think for me, two things come to mind. One is more personal and something that didn't occur to me until I was several years into teaching. And then the other is something that's maybe a little more general. The personal aspect is um, I felt really disconnected creatively in my first several years of teaching. I wasn't writing. Um, I wasn't doing anything that sort of made me feel like I was contributing creatively to the world. And that's that's not everybody's drive, but it's definitely one of mine. Um, you know, I spend, you know, a significant portion of the year doing something creative, whether it's writing music or just writing or whatever. I mean, there's a lot of different elements to that that, that can be fulfilling. Um, and so going through those, as you as you put them, the sort of the legs of the stool can help you realize, oh, it's actually that thing that's making me feel disconnected. And so for a lot of my young students, the thing that they often don't anticipate is they've been in college with peers who are all their age, who all have similar interests, and, you know, they're just having a wonderful social time all the time. They don't think about the way in which being a teacher might be isolating. So they go to that 2A school, and they're the band and choir director, and everyone else is <laughs> a different age group than them, and they can't seem to make connections with anybody because they now are there with their, maybe their, their boyfriend, girlfriend, their partner, and that's it. And so they, they're feeling isolated and alone and thinking through how they might connect with other people. So we actually talk about some of the ways to, they might connect with others in that scenario. Um, and th those are just kind of two examples of perhaps unexpected, but seriously important elements of a life well lived that, that I go through with them. And it's such a good kind of reference back to the guardian of your time. If you have given every second of your being to be involved in 500 things, where can you find the time to fix or to find your people, which is such an important aspect of life in general. So these are great little things to think about if you're a new or beginning teacher. So let's let's fast forward. So okay. what do we call mid-career? Is that the next level up? Well, we we do talk about some of the things that might affect them in that, you know, in that zone of their life as well. So we talk through their entire week currently, you know, what they're currently doing. And I ask them to to sort of list out what is their day? What is their day comprised of? And for some of them, of course, they come back and they're like, well, you know, I usually watch an hour and a half of Netflix in the evening, you know, and they have that leisure time. But some of my students are putting themselves through college. They're working. Um, they are maybe working more than one job and they come back and it's and we look at it and just say, all right, where where is where are decision points for your time? And then we think through the typical day of a teacher and we I try to point out to them, look, this is great. You've got a lot of things going on. These are your ideal things you want to do. But notice you're leaving the house at seven o'clock and you're getting home at around six or seven because of all these things you've decided to do. Where is the room in there for you to have you know, a, a significant other, for you to have a spiritual life, for you to go to the gym, for you to think about preparing your own meals because you're going to have to do that. You know, Those kinds of things they just don't think through because they're they're going to the dining hall. They've got a gym right out the back door, which they don't go to necessarily. So they, they've got all these decisions that are going to be coming in their middle career stage, um, not to mention things like children and, you know, pets, whatever. I mean, you know, lots, lots and lots of extended ways in which their their network is going to be challenging for them. 
It's interesting to hear you talk about it because as I've started this new job this quarter, I mean, I loved my last job for four years, but it became like the routine. I had the same schedule every semester. I taught the same classes on rotation. It was so easy to create life around it because it was known and didn't change. And now I'm in a place where creatively, like great teaching is celebrated. Creative teaching is celebrated. And I feel like my creative cup is full for the first time in like a decade. I am just constantly striving for new and innovative ways and it feels so good. But on the flip side, I never have the same schedule ever from quarter to quarter. And it flips crazy. Like I might start at 8 a.m. or I might go until 8 p.m. with these like weird and our classes are two and a half hours long. Oh. Um, it's it's so much fun. Oh my gosh, you get used to it and you get so deep. I mean, these yeah. kids get so much content. We, it, Oh my gosh, I could talk about that for hours. But I'm sitting here like you said, planning your food and cooking for yourself. I'm like, oh, I didn't cook for myself a single time last quarter because I was always teaching <laughs> during yeah. every type of meal break. And so I got really good at the hearty snacks is what I called them <laughs> sure. because there was no time. But I knew it was only for 10 weeks before it would change again. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a piece of the, I guess, maturity puzzle of knowing that this isn't my forever schedule. Yeah. But it's still a great question as we're looking at this mid-career when you're starting to reach the point of I'm not creatively satisfied. What are some of the things if you were talking instead of your to your college kids, but talking to people mid-career, what are some of the things that you would want them to look at specifically? Well, it's funny you mentioned that. I've, so I've been to a couple conferences recently and um, and this has come up with colleagues who are thinking to themselves, well, you know. Now I'm in this point in my career where everything's pretty good. Um, there are things maybe I thought would happen as a someday hoping to happen, and either they've already happened, so I've you know I've reached that pinnacle I thought I wanted to reach, or it's clear that pinnacle I thought I wanted to reach is is not something I want anymore, or it's not possible. Um, and so they're just thinking to themselves, what is it that I'm going to focus on now? And I think everybody has to answer that question in their own way. And uh, and I you know Steffi and I neither one of us deals with many folks who are in their midpoint of their career. She typically deals with just children. And of course I'm dealing with folks who are um, more, you know, more thoroughly dealing with folks day to day who are up through about age 23. And um, I think everybody has to kind of answer that in their own way. And we, we talk about tools for that, but mostly um, I think that it's, it's a question of what do you value the most in your life? We have colleagues I know who their career is their it. That's the thing that gets them up in the morning and keeps them going. Um, but I think for others of us, and I'll include myself, um, you start to realize that things like friendships, family, um, health, those kinds of things actually begin to take a little bit of priority. Um, and I think finding finding purpose is one of the difficult things as you reach that middle point in your career. It's such a great question, too, as you're you're evaluating your values and that it's OK that the job isn't everything because you're right. Those young whippersnappers first coming out of college, that is everything. It's all you've been soaking into for your entire life up to this point. But there has to be that shift where you acknowledge, yes, I'm heading down this path for that pinnacle point or I've passed the pinnacle. Now my path looks like this or I love traveling. Holy smokes, do I love traveling. That has become such a priority. And I never in a million years thought that I would put traveling over, I don't know, a gig. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it's funny you mentioned that because for us, we were fortunate enough to travel last summer for about six weeks um, to Europe. And we came away from that realizing, you know, we really also value our time at home with, with Winton. And, and so tra travel in a way, it sort of diminished for us just a little bit after having done so much of it. And he was with us. So it wasn't as if we were missing Winton, but we just, we just missed our home and missed our, our place and our people. And, uh, and that was a little bit of a revelation to us as well. And I think that's, that is a shift that is kind of a middle career thing, not an early career when you think, oh, I want to go to you know, Japan, Kenya, you know, some of the places I've been fortunate enough to go, it, those look so enticing, but now it's really much more about our, our nest that we've made. And I think acknowledging that and accepting it, that we all have different paths. You've already said some of our friends, the job is everything. It doesn't make you less of a person or more of a person. If that's your chosen path, I think it's acknowledging. And that I think is the beginning of everything. It's acknowledging your values, your perspective and being okay with that. 
Yeah. And perhaps that's something I should add to a discussion with my younger students is that not everybody has the same values and that that is OK, um, that there are people who are going to be out there burning the midnight oil for their job. Uh, but you shouldn't feel shame if that's, <laughs> if that's not how you feel about your job. You want, should want to do your best, of course, and be excellent for your students. But but it may be that you're you know, you're not going to stay at the school until 10 p.m. <laughs> that you need to go home. Do you talk to them about how to say no? I still think saying no is the most awkward thing. I'm getting better at it. But oh my gosh, is it hard? I, I think uh, I talk to them a lot about recognizing the points at which they can say no. I think that's the difficult part is once you've committed to something, it's very hard because that's something that you, you've said you're going to do. And most of us want to keep our word and do it. And we want to do our best in whatever it is we've committed to. But there are points where we could commit to something else or we could make a change. And I think also recognizing that those big moments are not uh, all behind us, that you could change things for the better in the future by changing your work situation, by changing your job, by doing something that that makes things either easier or fit your own set of values better once you've kind of figured out what those are. So it's not so much saying no and how to do it in a polite way. It's just knowing that those points are going to come and then think really long and hard before you say yes. And so adding time to the thought. You hinted on this when you said y'all have kind of shifted what you value in regards to like travel versus being home. How often do you think, and this is a very blanketed question, so you can go any direction. How often do you think we should reassess our values or do you think it just happens organically? Is this something we should be setting aside time to do as we end the year or start the next year? This is actually one of the tools that we talk about using to help make yourself feel more like that you have a good sense of what your life should be. Um, not everybody, I think not everybody feels the need to do this, but but we certainly do. And so at least once or twice a year, we sort of sit down and assess, like, how are things going? What's going on this year? Uh, we've talked a lot this fall. We've had some stuff happen to our family that is just kind of like painful and not super fun. Uh, we had the, the kitchen flood and we had a car accident and everybody's fine, but it was just just some stuff that just kind of made the, the personal element of our lives a little bit more difficult. But we've talked about how it's funny because as a family, we're very happy and satisfied. Professionally, we feel really good. So we actually talk about it both as the year goes along, but also we take specific moments. You mentioned the end of the year in January, we really have made a habit out of taking time, sitting down and, and assessing where things are and, and how we want to move forward for the next year. What do you think as you near end careers, as we're thinking of our friends and colleagues who are um, seeing the end of their career coming, what are some of the things that, that we can encourage them to think about or we can support them through or some of the other aspects from all of this brain mental stuff in choir directing? Yeah, it's fascinating that you, you're dwelling on this because, like I said, I just did a conference where there were a lot of lifetime awards given. Uh, NCCO gave a bunch of lifetime awards to some of our dear friends. And, you know, I also just did that virtual choir and it was a retirement gift for uh, a college choir conductor. And, um, you know, you, not everybody's going to have their students make a virtual choir for them out of all their alumni. <laughs> so that's not necessarily practical advice. But I did get misty several times just seeing these people. And it's, this is a 30 year career at this one school. So it's folks who range in age from 55 down to you know 23 who've just graduated. Uh, and this is all of this person's students. And so I don't, I don't know this person. <laughs> I, I was just asked to come in because they thought I could do it. But I, I was sitting there watching their students and this heartfelt song, um, their messages that they included. They did about a five minute video of back to back to back to back little quick greetings. But then some of them also did longer messages. And I just thought to myself, how grateful would we all be and happy if we could just dwell on the faces and the lives of the students we've had just for a little bit? There's almost no teacher, I think, who wouldn't come away from that feeling like their life had been well lived. Um, and it, it really touched me. So I guess that experience, this most recent experience, I would say in whatever way you can reflect with gratitude on all these students your life has touched um, and see if you can't see if you can't find a way to do that, whether it be a Facebook or reconnecting with a couple of key students, because it touched me and I knew no one involved. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, yeah. I was just the guest on a podcast, which let me just say like that is a weird little flippy floppy thingy that just <laughs> sure. happened. But mm -hmm. we were talking about when, like your value system and communicating your value as an educator. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And I think we, at one point he was like, you're just so positive about it. That's a choice. And life happens and there's moments where there's not positivity, but it sounds like everything that you and Stephanie are suggesting is still like proactive instead of reactive. Could yes. you give us a couple other just little hints? We're going to get the full toolbox of ideas later, but can you give us a couple others that we can dwell on? This episode's coming out the first of the year. So it's a great time for us to kind of reset and re-go. Yeah, well, so I'll give you a, a tiny uh, example first, which is one of my favorite things that I do now. And I think it actually is really impactful, even though it seems tiny. I have a friend who mentioned this in passing, and then I followed up with him. I said, well, what do you, talk more about that. What do you mean? Uh, he declares email bankruptcy uh, once a year. And what he does is he goes through and archives every one of his emails in January so that he has zero inbox at the beginning of the year, no matter what he's done through the year. Now, I'm guessing that's not really applicable advice for you. If I had to, if I had to guess, like you probably keep zero inbox like once a week or so. Um, but for a lot, a lot of folks, it's a major stressor. I look at their notifications and they have 3000 notifications and that is sort of a background noise stress for them all the time. And so that's just a small piece of beginning of the year advice that I really cherish and practice actually twice a year. And it's helped me to become more of a zero inbox person. Like I'm much more of the year, I have no email in my inbox. And so it's helped me to feel less stressed, more in command of things. Um, and that seems small, but that's kind of one small example from our presentation. The other thing we talk about um, going through in January is setting a big goal for yourself, one goal of something that would be truly impactful to you, uh, both you and I, and I think many others have practiced the behavior modification exercise of let's let's spend you know 60 days working on a new habit. And that's kind of what we encourage in this exercise is what is the thing, whether it's having meals as a family, whether it is embarking on an edu exercise routine, whatever it is, what is one thing that you could go through that would more closely align with the values that you think are missing in your life? And I think most people do that in a sort of a New Year's resolution sense, but it sounds like you're going to link to our presentation. Uh, we sort of detail how that can be done in, a, in an impactful way and hopefully in a way that will develop a new habit instead of just being one more resolution thrown by the wayside. I think that's the key point there is that it's a habit. Yeah. I think there's a habit to say yes in our field, especially early on in your career. You just say yes and yes and yes and yes and yes until you're almost overloaded and then you're stuck or you're burned out. And I think what you're talking about is little things that help remove the clutter in the background so you don't go straight to yes, but you have space to weigh it against guarding your time and what you value and being the yeah. best version of you. Well, and some of the things we do are seasonal and so as teachers. And so we're fortunate in that if we've said yes once, many of us run into the problem of fearing to say no the next time around because now we've rested and now it's a new year. So we're into the next thing. And so I think remembering what it felt like to be in the midst of that that chaotic moment is a, is helpful. Um, but you you know you've also mentioned you know we can do something for a short period of time. That can be good because we do go in this seasonal pattern. We can get out of the thing we were just frustrated by and stressed by. It can also be bad because it could, for some people it can serve as a justification. I can do this just for a little while. That was actually my refrain when I was when I was teaching high school, which was a big program, lots and lots of extra stuff. But then I was also associate conductor of a symphonic chorus. I was the co-conductor of an all-county chorus. I had a church choir, youth, handbells, children. Um, and all of that together was just too much. So making sure that you're not just like, oh, I can do it for a few weeks, but acknowledging that there needs to be your own guard, your own yeah. ruler. Yeah, yeah. That's so helpful. Yeah, I'm definitely going to link to your article and I'll link to anything I can find from your presentation. And then I know we'll get Stephanie on the podcast to give her her input from the mental side of it. But before we wrap up for today, what is the thing you want the listener to walk away from? The thing that really matters as we're talking about our profession and burnout. I think for me, the realization was that I am not necessarily the same person as my colleagues. You know, I, I had a, I had some, some moments of self doubt and moments when I thought, what is the matter with me? But instead to think, you mentioned the word proactive, to think proactively about what are my values? Now that I've been through this for two, three, five, 20 years, 
what are the things that really matter to me and where are my decision points to, to choose the things that matter to me instead of sort of just treading water as I float through the year? I think that's such a good analogy too, because sometimes we tread water when we're trying to live up to someone else's way of doing life. We just have to do our own thing with our own measures of possibility. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thank you so much for coming and sharing your side of this conversation, choir director, and the mental things that come along with it. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Yeah. All right, friends, it's 2024. It is January 24 when you are listening to this episode. I hope that you have enjoyed this quick chat with Dr. Troy Robertson as we talked about guarding our time and remembering you in everything that you do, recognizing the point where you can say no. Maybe you're going to borrow the email bankruptcy. Maybe you're going to look at where you can make decisions for your time, whatever it is that you're doing. You matter so much, my friend. We all know that music matters, especially how we handle our mental state so we can provide the best music and the best music education to the people in front of us. And I'll see you next time on Music and Me.